How are we feeling? Woo! Excited? Good? Yeah? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce our first poet. <laughs> so we have Craig Cosby, who is a Glasgow-based poet who writes about queerness, gender, and relationships. They perform regularly at poetry and cabaret nights around Scotland, have featured at festivals including the Edinburgh International Book Festival and Prima Donna, and have competed, competed in national level poetry slams. You can tell that I have a typo in my own writing now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, their work has been featured on BBC The Social, and in 2022 they wrote on stage, I didn't double check how to pronounce this, like anthropy, yeah. <laughs> Um, a new spoken word theatre show funded by Creative Scotland, which explores masculinity from a trans masculine perspective through a story about modern day werewolves. Their pamphlet of flash fiction, Love Pan Five, is available from Night Era Press, and I will say it is really amazing. When I had um, a really extreme breakup, it was under my pillow, and I read it many, many nights in a row. So, can we have a round of applause for Greek? Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Oh, it's not often that I'm, I'm taller than the last person on the mic. I mean, it's a smaller one. Uh, yeah, I'm great. It's really cool to be here um, and to be part of celebrating Bones launch. Um, yeah, it's really awesome to be here. Um, so I've been writing quite a lot of poetry about werewolves in the past few years um, and um, when I wrote the camp, we had a lot of material that didn't fit the show, sadly. So I'm going to start with one of those poems, um, because I like to think it has a home somewhere at least. Uh, it's called Little Red. In a courtroom, the big bad wolf's lawyer asks, how could Little Red Riding Hood not have noticed? How could she have been so unobservant? Finds it curious, he says. If your gran was suddenly all fur, pointed claws and sharp jaws, you would know, wouldn't you? Run, probably, like any reasonable person would. How didn't she notice? Asks the lawyer. Him assuming that a woman couldn't be sharp, couldn't be lupine cunning. But women don't survive to old age in the woods by being soft and smooth, not when they're surrounded by hungry wolves and hungrier axemen. This grandmother was wolf-like already. Wore her furred limbs unashamedly, she chopped her own wood and on Sundays cooked wolf meat stews. But the lawyer is still asking, how didn't Little Red notice? As though her not noticing is deserving. What did she expect when she lingered to ask questions, when knowing just how tasty she is, she stood there as a meal, such a silly little girl. She could have prevented this, been preemptive, carried escape plans in her basket, should have done as her mother told her. If you wander into the shadows, you're asking for trouble. Didn't she wear red, Your Honour? She literally dressed herself as a target. What do you expect? We all know the nature of wolves. And in the courtroom, the couldn't help himself will. The wolves will be wolves will. The animal instincts will. Wearing his expensively tailored, neatly ironed remorse hangs his head like they practiced. And the lawyer asks again, how didn't she notice? And the courtroom fills with a whispered echo of how didn't she notice? And the papers ask, how didn't she notice? And in the news feeds, in the comment sections, and over lunch, and on buses, everybody asks, how didn't she notice? Surely she would have noticed, surely anyone would have noticed. And in that courtroom, a girl made of curious feet in robin breast red, who left the path to look at toadstools, is told yet again that she is responsible for the appetite of wolves. Thank you. I first had an inkling that weight and health 
might not be synonymous. At age 15, while eating lunch outside the school gym hall, pretending I wasn't desperate for my friends past the bake and homemade chocolate muffin, pretending I was full up already on half a salad tub and the 55 calorie fruit biscuit thin that I allowed myself, berating what I had that week allowed myself. When Mr. Allen, head of the PE department, the adult responsible for teaching health classes, passing by, paused at our picnic, frowned down at the cake crumbs on my friend's knees. My friend who plays hockey three times a week and who's beaten me in every race we've ever run, who dances in front of the mirror in her bedroom and doesn't know what the back of a throat feels like on your fingertips. And with his stare drops the weight of his assessment over the curves of her body. Then he looks from my slimness past the shadows under my eyes to my last small bunch of salad leaves says to me, what a healthy lunch. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do one more poem. It's called Taboo. Um, I'm never too sure where this one's appropriate to take out and not appropriate to take out, uh, but I'm glad that there's, there's no children here, so I think we're okay. <laughs> Amanda has been the excuses. She scrubbed off the words gross and disgusting because actually she quite likes it. She likes having sex on her period. Hira does it on her lighter days only. In the shower, usually, where any traces of shame can be rinsed away and swallowed by the drain. Meanwhile, Carrie loves how her nerve endings are extra sensitive on the days that she's heaviest. Susie, too, knows the benefits. Chooses to fight those cramps with orgasms instead of paracetamol. It swaps out hot water bottles for the warm press of skin. And Audrey, She's been trying to conceive for years, so takes her chances, dares to hope on that slim risk of pregnancy her teachers warned her about. Scout and her girlfriend now quite like the aftermath, how their skin is finger painted and strokes and gas grabs, their bed sheet a canvas dashed with different shapes of womanly. As for Benny, it's his least favourite time of the month. Because men toilets don't have the right kind of bins for things and pads just do not fit on boxers. Those six days he struggles with himself that bit harder. But in bed, Tom, his partner, Guides apart means string in his teeth eases that cotton free unfaced enough for both of them and loves him in all the same ways. She loves how she's the only one who knows that shade of red on her wife's lips, how it's shared in a kiss and smeared in the back of their fists. Meanwhile, Nina, she fucks Aisha as a fuck you because there's no taboo in her body. Not when it's her blood, her stubble blue legs, her curves, her body hair tangled in her fingers, their bedding like a crime scene where misogyny was murdered. June has long since given up feeling ashamed. Deborah wants the kind of love that leaves behind stains. Blue plays it safe, they use condoms and prep. And Lynette, she doesn't like period sex, so chooses not to do it. And that is fine too. But for the third of the population who are sexually active, who, according to studies, apparently do, why is it the impulses have slowed? hair flattened, close, straightened? Why is it that the passion and fun and love and just general indifference towards periods and sex while on them 
is so often left behind under cooling doobies or tucked away between soap bottles and sponges or lost on the side of the sofa seat. It's blood that flushed those cheeks. It's blood that makes our hearts beat. Thank you so much. How cool was that? That was great. Thank you so much. We do have a couple copies of Gray's books, so please buy them. They're great. Our next performer is Shane Strachan. So I'm like really tiptoeing, but I'm not going to move it because Shane is taller than me. Um, <laughs> Shane Strachan's debut collection, Dwarms, will be published in April by Tapsal Teary, and we will also be doing an event. So please come. Um, he was awarded Scots Champion at the 2023 Scots Language Awards following his year at the National Library of Scotland. Scots, is it Scriba? Yes, thanks. I've been I've been checking all of my all of my Scots of shame this evening. Um, <laughs> his previous works include the novella Nevertheless, uh, The Shelter, which was staged with the National Theatre of Scotland, and multiple poems and stories in Gutter, New Writing Scotland, Stand, Northwoods Now, amongst others. His poetry has also appeared on Lucy Radio 4 and in Aberdeen Art Gallery. He holds a PhD in creative writing from, from the University of Aberdeen, where he now lectures in creative writing. Can we please give Shane a warm welcome? Okay. Am um, I also pleased that there's Naomi Behrens here if we can confirm that before I read mine? Um, as you can probably tell, I'm from the northeast of Scotland. Um, I died in Aberdeen. I have since 2006 and have lived under the shadow of the island gas by uh, this time. So I'm going to just read one longer poem, which uh, is about Aberdeen's bad romance with island gas. And it's to the perspective of Isle sticking to the city across time. And it's called Jeepin. You have a new message. Message received 14th of September, 1969. Hello, sexy. It's me, your North Sea sugar daddy. Wheat, sweet, and fine. God's gift to me, Danny. Ain't you winding down there? Just leave your wife behind. Flee to your mermaid island and find a deep beneath. Get yourself sight and wheat, seep and pump them pipelines. Three bit. Mind that time back in 69. Ooh, it was love at first sight when you drowned me, doom at the bottom of the deep blue sea. Unleash this genie's tie dye rainbow, slick, thick, viscous liquid. In me, you watched me impress, witness time decompress, heated, treated, refined. Oh, yes. Now I'm here, don't I stress? Just give your mother crack, sit back and relax and relax. We dream like a baby deep, like a deus ex machina, a god for the machine, saving the grand city for another tragic scene. But mine and Hutcher wish that we spells and weeks. It's really best we keep out between you and me if you want me to act. Your fossil fantasy. You have one new message. Message received. 3rd of August, 1986. Hello there, sexy. Come on, you darling, no need to peek. I thought you eyes were a tough dude. It kind of came into jungles and set up industries. Yet here you are greeting because of the own flaming Saudis dropping the price of a barrel to six dollars a piece. Fire rolling Middle East sheiks and bunker hunts in Texas. Hit the sense to talk control on your ass. Ken how? They did not bow down to an iron lady, cow tow like some little bitch. Go on, admit it. You Scots love to lay back and talking, love to be subjugated, subpar, submissive, a subplot, and there's master narratives. Did I make sure you in gifts? You can taste of being rich. 
I am neither dictator here. Just look for your company's dictator in a conscience of one stop. You want so desperately to be the J.R. Ewing Aberdeen, but you're neither only the inkling in this place. Fishermen, bakers, cars, bakers, are all rooster boots and roughnecks in, seeking after their own fairy tale fortune. So if you want to be the high hegen, cock of the north in this region, Tap me notice of them women, former minor unionizers, chase men. Ah, oh, it's a sale, pleasurous, boom and bust this, see the masochistic reward and risk, bound up in garb and threats of black blister, keeping the dirty secrets, keeping the kick king, doing on the doom roll, speaking in the technical lingo. About gushers and boats, big bears and bean chunks, well heads and shackles, thrill fingers and thrill fingers. Hey men, just keep the food. You want power, sex, and money? Then you'll hate to see all of these top types. Otherwise, you can gang and giant the back of the door key. You have one new message. Message received. 11th of July, 2008. Hiya, sexy. Even though you like it rough, throughout the past two decades, sometimes I've been a bit tough. But I'm chuffed with sorted things out. You know you've got your bonny hoose up in the slide then soon. And all them Caribbean cruises to keep the wood sweet and shut your bairns loose. I'll be the first to admit that things have been a bit of there's been jitters of our wars and terrorist attacks, but look, all things been dandy since Dick persuaded Bush to gang an invade Iraq. Aye, it surely couldn't have hurt on hollow button to get a rocky on Scotland. Nobody cares there's no weapons of mass destruction from the price of a ball of Iowa sky hurtling. Finally, I've made yourself made me. So fit on earth could possibly gang on. You have one new message. Message received, 14th of February, 2016. Hello? Sexy? And when he's speaking, have you really forgotten about me? Did I make keep you sweet all through the naughty noughties? And when you dare decree it's time to get up on me? For the likes of renewable energy. The amical caddies off the coast of Brittany to deep water horizon showing up BP. For never I can public, suddenly I'm obscene and you want to keep it clean. Mark on, you're turned on by turning green. Why can't you just defeat your eye boost to me? Pay off your government to swiftly avert the pain. You never used to complain about the spells of smells. I thought you liked it when I was dirty. I thought you liked to gag, you liked to choke. I ken things have got me. I say along the why, and you've long tried to ditch me like a chum. But surely you must see that you can't just pump and dump me. I'm 24 black gold, kind of black gold, baby. It's as I be you. Am I too mature for you? Frack off all you want, but you'll soon realise as hell time I've been seeping, drip, drip, dreaming into every orifice of your life. Be the petal in your car, the fake tits in your wife. Just admit it, I gave you your freedom, your liberty to be anything you ever lacked. You can, you can't keep it up without keeping me. Come on, why swear I'll knock you a winner and smear. And think you're a star, you can do anything. Grab him by the drill pipe and mark Aberdeen to meet again. <laughs> you have a new message. Message received today at 9.15 a.m. Hello, sexy. Still me speaking. You've left not on red. Little blue text. The silent treatment. Fucking dick. Because I was something once. Now I found you drew your lines over me. 
their national boundaries, donating their country's trust fund money for me. My waist pockets are sunshine converted into forests and trees. I glistened and plumped and spunked up on the bed to ancient seas. I sleep in beauty, transform it into glossy hydrocarbons and glow in the bulb of being your feet. That's right. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. We that ancient, long lost light. I might be an ara fired through history, but you're the aim that's decreed our thing deep. It's about time you faced up to reality. You'll never escape from a fearful symmetry. You've used up all your paper, your combs, your fish, your granite, your coal, and seen from your desperate, only hope will be a go. You'll come running back to seek up the very last of my shales or out of grass, a last grass before you burn, baby, burn, and as disco burn on top your last grass. Oh, with some power, the gift it gives us to see ourselves as others see us. We'll Dare you look through the glazed statue. You want to see my face like the wizard dolls, sit in a hand curtain. It'll be a rain sail reflected back in this anti mountain black hole that sucks you in, sook by sook, to the scene cancel in another beat. But far was obvious, and far was you to dust. Ashes to ashes, boom to bust. Of weapon time, silence, dust. I had to move it in time. Um, thank you so much, Shane. I really want to get you on retainer for like our protest sign workshops because. Those plugs were actually phenomenal. <laughs> so it is now my pleasure to introduce Len Penny. Len Penny is a poet who writes predominantly in the Scots language. She writes passionately about the promotion of minority languages, survivors of domestic abuse, and the destigmatization of mental illness. Can you please have a really big round of applause for Len? Hey, uh, how's it going? So I'm going to start with a piece called Ains Upon a Time. And I wrote this about a guy who had just pied me. And I, I'm struggling now to remember his name, so. Ains <laughs> <laughs> Upon a Time or Two in a kingdom far away Lived a lass who found a prince Who said he couldn't stay he didn't want to hurt her because she really was guy sweet, but he chose to sweep her clean away and steady off her feet. He said that it was him, no her, and fell upon his sword. A noble knight, so full of shite, who couldn't keep his word. He gave her fish pertaining to his lackey want to stay, and said the things a noble knight is often want to say. You'll find a prince near capable of giving you a save, but a lively here of comfort is a hang your soul may crave. So back asleep the princess went, as if by some great trick. Her finger poised for next time she'd receive another prick. <laughs> so I'll leave you as we are warning for the princesses out there. There's no deficit of princess for a noble maiden fair. But don't you lose your heed for every push you find disarming. Because sometimes frogs are preferable compared with Prince Uncharming. And then if asked your princess for your soulmate, he was not. This prince was near ending. He was filler for your plot. So ride into the sunset where your crown aboon your head. Because looking back on prince's past, I'd sooner ride the steed. <laughs> uh, this next one I wrote in collaboration with a uh, survivor's group at Women's Aid. I was very privileged to be able to sit in on a meeting and to listen to their stories and then I was tasked with turning that into a piece of poetry. And it was quite surreal for me because um, a few days earlier I actually had my own women's week meeting. So it was a nice kind of way to get back to a charity who has revolutionised the way that we treat 
survivors of domestic abuse. So this is narratives. I'm telling my story. It's mine after all. And this masterpiece won't write itself. What started as tragedy turned into hope, the weight of which buckles the shell. I put I into life and then life into me as I reconstruct what was once gone. I stoked every ember my heart could remember and I nourished the flames till they shone. I wrote down the hangs I know here in my life and I found that from heartache and pain I took strength and resilience, a beautiful brilliance and wrote pride with a once scrubbed shame. And I have done more than just simply get by, so much more than escape or survive. Through the galvanization of love, time and patience, I take hold of my story and thrive. After life that was seldom what life ought to be, through laughter and love, I'll be whole. This story is mine, from the cover to spine, and the narrative I will control. This next piece is actually the first poem I ever wrote. It's the first poem in the book. And it's one that gets quite a mixed response because it describes a very dark place and being in that place and looking up in that place and not seeing an escape. So I promise you, it's a lot more hopeful from here on out. It's called Honey, by the way. Open the jar, honey. Just let me try to describe how my brain tells my body to die from you, darling, baby, sweet angel, my love. A cast iron fist and a velvet soft glove. I know that you're gone, but it hurts all the same. The bruises have healed, but I can't ease the pain of knowing I let you, permitted, relented. And the thoughts of your hands leave my body demented. I'm haunted by spirits slowly on rocks and the incessant tick of biological clocks and the taste on my tongue of your honey sweet lies and the beat of my heart drowned in orchestral cries makes me laugh honey my name became honey something too fucking sweet and all that i am became something to eat to consume and use up to be gorged and left bare and i begged you to stop but you just didn't care you sucked on my bones and you picked the meat clean and your fingers were gentle and hurt like a dream and it felt in a way that I can't quite describe. Like I was a banquet for you to invite. I'm starving, honey. You called me honey. Though I said that it pained me and day after day you bit down and you drained me of blood, of nectar, of hope and desire and you opened the stove and threw me on the fire and I burned myself, honey, so brightly for you. And I prayed that you'd fall in and burn with me too, but you liked to watch me with intimate care as my flesh reached a succulent medium rare and I can't help but find it a little divine. But my tears taste like beer and my ashes like wine and though you loved a drink, you'd refuse just to taste. You'd rather I rot into saccharine waste. And I did, honey. Now I have a name and it sure isn't honey and of things I can focus on, this one is funny. It makes a cute metaphor, sticky and sweet. And we can laugh about boyfriends and what they can eat. But as with all things, there's a little bit more. There's you standing proudly and me on the floor, and I can't wash you off. God knows that I've tried. But when soap's been rinsed off and I'm all nice and dried, you're still there. Like honey has been poured on my skin. And I know in my heart that I can't let you win. But you have, honey. So from the first poem, we'll go to the last poem, and just as the kind of um, these narratives explained, there was a, a very, very gradual but very, very hopeful story of healing and getting better and feeling safe again. And the, the last piece in the book is Father and the Children, and it is really the, the piece that kind of started all this because it ended up going viral and then people actually said, oh, you know what, you might, you might want to try writing a few more poems. So uh, it's, it's because of this poem that I'm here, and it's it's a, a real kind of love letter to my mum and to the Scots language because those are two things that constantly bring me joy and, and it's two things that I love the most in the world. So this is I'm not having children. 
I'm not having children. I'm going to hear wings and you can ask what I cry and I'll know what are their names. They'll be getting a piece. They'll be pie lunch. They'll be hearing a scran, no having a munch, and they'll fanny a boot. They'll only waste time. And when they scream, their wee poems, I'll make sure they rhyme. I'm not having children. I'm going to hear wings. They'll be gouping and feeling when they've got aches and pains, and instead of don't worry, I'll say, Can they vanish? Instead of stand your ground, and he take all his snash, my wings will be crabbing. No in a bad mood. No greet, no cry when their day is no good. I'm not having children. I'm going to hear wings with a pretty ancient language crammed in their wee brains. And whenever life tells them that English is bad, I'll tell them the hassles that their mammy had. And I'll say my ma's words to the day that I'm dead. You'll be all right, hen, with a good Scots tongue in your head. Sorry, I just really enjoyed that. I didn't even have any words in my head when I came up here. That was amazing. Can we just have another round of applause? Uh, There's a 10 minute break just now, so please go and grab another drink, have a chat, perhaps even go and purchase a book, maybe, who knows? Um, and then I'll invite you all back up here for our next performer and for a wee chat with Len. Thank you so much. <laughs>
five million because they don't have idea after that, you know. Thanks. Hello. 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 Two minutes goes fast. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Ten minutes goes fast as well. Could we please have the lights? Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. So fun. Um, so I'm going to do some things with the lights. Oh, but I'm going to introduce our next performer. Our next performer is Hussein Rebecca Azel, who is a Glasgow based poet. Her work has been published widely in magazines and anthologies including in Poetry Wales, Poetry Scotland, and Modern Poetry in Translation. The team has worked on projects with the likes of the Poetry Translation Centre, the Poetry... I'm sorry, I'm losing myself by how many times I'm saying poetry. <laughs> the, the Poetry Business and the Rugby League World Cup. She has received a Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award for Poetry and was shortlisted for the Edwin Morgan Poetry Award. Nassim has performed across the UK and regularly chairs events. Her debut pamphlet, Nemi Dunham, was published by Verve Poetry Press in February 2023, and it is a killer. And we have some, so we should buy it after. <laughs> My pants as I kick over that water bottle at some point. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Nassim. Um, so I'm going to do a few poems for you before we get back to men and my Q&A. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to do for you is um, it's sort of based on a game that we used to play in primary school. Um, it's called Kiss Chase or Kissy Tig. Um, if you don't know it, it's like where you play like tag with somebody, but when you catch them, like you kiss them. Um, so yeah, we stopped playing it when we were like nine or ten because any, anything close to puberty and act is like a bit weird. Um, so this is a poem about playing it when I was nine, when it was okay. <laughs> we are nine and playing princesses, arms spiraling like sycamore seeds we careen from one end of the big yard to the next. Grey pleats pan from our empty hips like ball gowns, and the plaques trailing our pigtailed heads of budding wings. If we lay down in our shadows, we'd be dwarfed. You decree. So we spin and spin and spin and spin until grass is sky and clouds are daisies, and then we tumble, flushed, breathless, knees raised, limbs skidding on tarmac, laughing. On bruised elbows, I cross my legs and look at you. And when the war cry breaks out, our classmates scatter like dandelion seeds. I make a wish. Then we are up and running across the field, over the hill, away, away from the power of the boys nipping at our small heels. I'm faster than you. A berry brown wave already used to fleeing the rumblings of a man, so your fingers stretch for mine. And I pull you behind me, ignore my bursting heart, the mess of moths rising and the dust of my stomach. I can't catch my breath. But as I turn to your buttercup hair, my chin is glowing. You are the most beautiful thing my short life has seen. And I don't know what this means, 
So I release your milk bottle fingers and let a boy with hair as gold as yours snatch you instead. And I'm glad that he's not old or bold enough to pucker up. Your lips stay apple red. That night, I opened my snow white diary. Right, I'm scared I might love girls. Reread my unjoined letters, bury them in felt tips, slam shut the boot and feed it to the monsters under my bed. Um, so the next one I'm going to do is another love, love poem, if you want to call it like that. Um, and sort of keeping in with some of the some of the themes that we've heard this evening, it's about online dating. Um, so this is based on a message that I got on Tinder. I've written it down. Incredible. In July 2018, um, and the text that I got is like part of the poem. So when I do this and put like a silly voice on. That's, that's like the real message that I got. It's not me just being a bit strange. Um, cool, and it's called hashtag dating while brown. Swipe right, left, chat, last. In a corner of my screen, yet unread message glares red. My thumb flicks, lazy, taps the beacon. And alarm emojis ring in my head. A strange man said, sells himself the ethnically ambiguous girl. I once ate Bombay mix at Anissa's. <laughs> it's one at four p.m. <laughs> Maybe he has Glazar on the brain, racked his mind to find the ingredients of my DNA. I blink, breathe in, end out. Bear, courage. I unleash my fingers. Let my thumbs pay pixel symphonies to explain away my brow. I want to tell them that dough bloodlines wrap around the caduceus of my body, but these veins are not my heart at all. I want to tell them I am Sigmor, cut my feathers streaming from my scalp. I want to tell them that he's picked the wrong region, and my people are herby, not spicy. I stew, you stew, we stew pots of sabsi, and I taste that heritage with an English tongue. I want to tell them that I've not visited a mixer since I ran out of mixer at a memory meeting in an old friend's flat. I'm pretty sure I bought some walker's sensations, along with the own-brand lemonade. But I definitely paid in pounds. I don't think they'd accept the reals that I don't know how to count. I want to tell him that I hung the flag of Iran above my high five when I was 12. Right next to my maze magazine, Nick Jonas Shrine. <laughs> I want to tell him that Epson burns in that yellow bedroom. I want to tell him that John Denver blasted from those speakers. The vibration shake in the green, white, red, sab, sefis, clemes. I want to tell him that album is my bubble's favorite. I want to tell them that I don't know my country's roads, that I've not been since 2015 and I'll be imprisoned if I ever go back. I want to tell them, in our house, my mom's Jordi Dastan make the best chai. Instead, I type, there is nothing ambiguous about my dual existence. But just delete the message and remove him from my Zen Beggy. So, as you probably heard, there was um, quite a bit of like Persian flowing through that poem. Um, and like I mix, so I sort of have like quite a fun relationship. It's problematic, complicated. Um, extensive relationship with the Persian language um, because I'm not fluent, so I kind of learned it. I could do like really domestic stuff when I was wee, like, you know, sit down, shut up, who farted, come here, um, eat that, you know, stuff like that. But I was like, I've been learning it as an adult. So it's kind of really nice to explore it through poetry. Um, and yeah, that poem featured a lot of it. And this next one I'm gonna do is, I think the first poem that I wrote kind of mixing those languages together. 
Um, so this one doesn't have as much in it, but it's yeah, it's kind of like a nice homage to I think like Persian heritage. Um, and it's called a resurrection in northwest Iran imagined. Momon Bazir splits threads in the Caspian sun. We hear again her rusted tongue speak. We paint carpets Persian. Here again the lamb she lamb raise their heads at the sound of her song. Hurisari dances. She calls to a god who answers and cheers again, Gorgaz. Sweet flowers shed thorns and burst through dry soil to carpet her feet. Sunlight holds her. She won't disappear again. Under a pole of flower she needs, birth naan and cherry wine. Saffron rose in time crescendo in her mouth. She feels again and moves to the city where her children grew with the mountains. She toddles the knees to the park. Happy tears again, she crosses the world and wonders if it's fate keeping the plane adrift. A runway of stars leads her to us. The skies clear again and Boba gets a chance to say goodbye, but won't, not again. She makes space for me beside her on our living room floor and says in the seat, Biard and John, come here again. Um, so one of the last poem for me, um, and this one is quite a, like stylistically, like an interesting one. So the idea is that like each blank space in the poem has three options. And if you're like reading the poem on the page, you get a like circle which option you want. So it's kind of like Mad Libs, but multiple choice. So there's like loads of different ways the poem can go. Um, but yeah, when I'm performing it, I will let you kind of do that as we go along. So for each blank space, what we'll like is I fill in the words. So in your head, you can take one. Um, and I guess just as like, just a warning sort of, there's kind of allusions to sexual assault in this poem. So if you're uncomfortable with that, I'm just let me know in advance. Um, yeah. So it's called Fill in the... You were 15, 32, 21. And it was summer, February, yesterday. The sun, moon, stars had risen. All was well. You were alone with friends, waiting. In a club public the streets, your trackies dress, jeans, so comfy. The sky wore you like a second skin. You were glowing in the light of lampposts, mobile strobes. You, so bold, so fierce in all your rainburned, sweat dewed, star sprayed splendor. The future was yours if you dared to seize it. He was your friend, a friend's friend, a stranger, when he saw you in a club public the street. You thought he was beautiful, kind, a creep, and told him so. You were tipsy, sober, drunk, and told him so. He was wearing trackies, jeans, a suit, and said you were beautiful, kind, a treat, he asked for your name, a dance, your number, then circled you like a sharp planet final answer in a club public the street while you pretended he was invisible. In a club public the streets, the room, a house, that bed, music, silence, time was too loud. It beat with your heart. His wrists, Shoulder blades, forearms, were strong, barbed, rough against the softness of your flesh. His voice was muffled, laughing, urgent, when he told you to relax, relax, relax. His teeth were tombstones. He smelled like rain, sweat, your favorite aftershave, and all your organs turned to stone. Your bruises shaped like moss, teeth, grapes, 
speckled like nebulae across your thighs, neck, chest. Your body was pain, betrayal, another's. The world began again that autumn, April night. That autumn, April night, you learned how quickly life, safety, hope, shift beneath the weight of things we cannot name. You last saw him yesterday, Thursday, tomorrow, in a club public the streets, the sun, moon, stars, still morning. He waved, ignored you, liked your photo on Instagram. Your breath flickered, faltered, stuttered, like a hummingbird, light air, mouse. It's still autumn, April night, and still in a club, public, the street, you should not, cannot, will not, relax, relax, relax. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, like just, just so, so beautiful. Um, in a in a second, I will introduce Len to have a little chat. But I just, I wanted to say there is a reason that I haven't said the name of the book tonight, and that is because, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm English. Um, and the other night I was speaking to my friend about this, and I said poems. Um, but just added a Y in the middle, like poems, um, and like just tricked over my Englishness basically. And a friend sat down with me for 10 minutes and tried to get me to say it right. And so now I'm really nervous about saying any Scots word ever. Um, <laughs> but I'm like kind, kind of unavoidable. So um, I did, I tried, I tried with them. She said it's right and that Scots is for everyone. So. Could we please give Len a big round of applause to discuss poems? Oh, I've got, got my claw, my claw is stuck. There's something about chairs like these, right? That make me feel really regal, but also like I need to be held accountable for something. Okay. Um, <laughs> Did I? Yeah, you good. Just need to tilt it a bit. Hello. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's get started. Um. So you've mentioned the word viral already. So now I have to talk about the dreaded TikTok, <laughs> which might not be that dreaded to you because you're on it all the time and everyone loves you on there. Um. And I know you because of your Scots word of the day, first and foremost. So I just wonder if you could please share with us the Scots word of the day today. Scots word of the day today is Wachi, which is a nickname for a white house. <laughs> See, I do plan them. <laughs> like five minutes before it gets done, but there is some thought that goes into it. So. That's amazing. Oh, that's made me feel really special. Now it's only just for you. Yeah, yeah. It's not even my bookshop, I feel real good about it. Um, <laughs> I just look there. Um, so I'm just gonna get from nitty gritty now. That's all right with you. Um, so I was mentioning TikTok. You've done a lot of poems for us already, and it and it's kind of come up. But a grim reality of being like a woman online is the audacity of men and misogynistic trolling just like absolutely thrown at you. Um, you're not one for letting that like those men just slink away. I'd love to shine a little light on it. Um, do you find that it's an integral part of your feminist practice and activism? I think it's an integral part of my feminist activism. I don't think it's an integral part of everybody's, or it shouldn't be an integral part of everybody's, because activism is personal and it takes a lot of energy for me to combat in my own new way the things that men say to me if people don't have the energy for that and they'd rather use that energy for something that they think is worthwhile i think that is something they should do i don't think everyone should be beholden to this idea that you have to 
speak up and speak out about misogyny for men because it's exhausting, it's relentless, and unfortunately, it's not a problem you can solve. And coming to terms with that, coming to terms with the fact that it's not a problem I'm going to solve has been a bit of a learning curve because at the start I thought, right, if I if I just make enough videos and I just write enough poems and I just, you know, fire off it and enough comments, they're going to stop. But unfortunately, I've had to come to terms with the fact they're never going to stop and they never will stop. So uh, to answer your question in a more succinct way, it's part of mine. It might be part of yours and that's okay. That's, yeah, that's a really, really good answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, mm, it's very useful that it's part of yours, so I just want to like, thank you for that. Um, and, yeah, it's always um, really, really funny. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, you can keep, keep it coming. Yeah, it's funny. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> really smart, really brilliant. Yeah, I love it. Uh, my next question um, ties into that, I suppose, because so much of your poetry does grapple with mental health and like you mentioned yourself in the book that a lot of it comes from that dark place you mentioned it earlier when you were performing as well how do you balance that with such a high online profile uh, and with so many dicks about People keep using the word brave. See, whenever I talk about mental illness, people are so brave. So brave to talk about mental illness. And I hate that. I hate that it's brave to talk about mental illness. And I'm going to keep talking about mental illness until it's not brave. Because, like, everybody's got mental health. Everybody has mental health. I'm sick of saying, people saying, she's a, she's, she speaks up about, you know, her, her, her mental health. I speak up about mental illness because everybody has mental health and they should look after it to help avoid the preventable parts of mental illness. I feel like if we if we started as a society talking about mental illness enough and in the right ways and in the productive ways, it wouldn't be brave because it doesn't feel like an act of bravery for me to say I'm depressed because it's just the truth. And it's not something that should be shameful. So it's not something that I feel like I'm shrugging up anything ashamed. Um I was I was raised in a house with a lot of mental illness actually, kind of hereditary mental illness. And for a while it wasn't talked about. And I, I would always wonder, I'd be like, well, what am I doing to make these people sad? You know, why are these people sad? What's the reason? What's the fixable reason? What can I do to help people? And and then it was it was only when I started experiencing mental illness that I was like, oh hang on. It's not my fault. It's it's the brain's fault. It's the body's fault. It's the society's fault. So it was only when I started experiencing my own mental illness that I started to take it quite seriously and understand that sometimes there's nothing you can do but listen and talk. And like both things are helpful sometimes. Sometimes you don't want to talk. And I would never advocate for everybody to talk about their mental illness because sometimes you don't want to. It's exhausting. Being mentally ill is exhausting. But if you have the energy, you should surround yourself with people who create a space within which you can see the things you need to and they'll listen and act on it. It doesn't have to be people trying to fix you because there's nothing in here that would be broken about mental health people. But there should be a space made for them to express themselves. And sometimes the best thing to do is just sit in it with them. They don't need you to, to fix all the problems because some of the problems are internal. But you can just sit there and listen. And it's, it's interesting talking about it online. Because for a lot of people that, that leave me comments, they say, oh, this is the first time I've seen that I was talked about so frankly. And it's, it's maybe it's because I don't really do social cues very well, but I don't, I don't think there should be, I don't think there should be any kind of euphemism around mental illness, which is ironic because as a poet, I euphemize mental illness professionally. <laughs> um, and I do it quite well. Quite <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we should euphemize it. I don't. I don't think we should say, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling. I'm feeling tired. I'm not feeling well. I think we should say, I'm taking a day off today, off of my job, my professional job, because I am going to take a mental health day, because I'm going to try and and approach mental health the same way I approach physical health. And and for me, there's no there's no difference. There's no there's no discrepancy between mental and physical health because the last time I checked, the brain was part of the body. So you know, for me. I approach mental illness online the way I approach it in my everyday life, which is just to treat it as something that is 
an observable reality and to validate that for most of other people. That was really brilliant. <laughs> it, it was, it was. I, I mean, so many, so many things in there, but I don't have enough time because I know at some point I have to ask people in the audience questions, which is unfair, um, <laughs> but I will. Um, but I love those parts about community and finding people who will hold you as you are. And that's really brilliant. Um, and as a really smooth segue, would you please euphemize mental illness? Of course. I always advocate for euphemizing mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I wrote this, this is called self-help. And I wrote this because one of the times I was very publicly mentally ill, uh, people keep giving me advice. And I have been, I have been diagnosed with about a hundred different conditions by people online. Mm -hmm. I have been offered about a thousand different remedies ranging from, you know, cup of tea, we walk to actually magic mushroom. <laughs> Do you be surprised how often you'll be prescribed magic mushrooms? And I'm not trying them, but I mean, they're convincing. <laughs> they're convincing in their sales pitch. So this is self-help. Good news, lads. We've cracked the case. Now here are we confession. Some genius on the internet has figured out depression. Again, it sounds a wee bit strange and gay hard to believe. When you've never had it, it's amazing what you can achieve. So one day, as I wallowed in a sad, depressive hole, a state, mind you, of which we know, I had complete control. And even though I didn't hear the energy to move, I knew I had to fix myself for once and all to prove that depression is a thing I chose. To fix it's up to me. So I tamed this ancient sage advice and made a cup of tea. And then maybe something didn't work because I did it wrong. Because although I still felt weak as pish, the tea was feeling strong. Still, undeterred, I had some mere things I can do control. I tamed this dude's advice, you see, and went on a wee stroll. Now in his notes, he didn't seem to ken the reason why. Despite all this good sound advice, I still might want to die. It's almost like, and hear me out, because this will blow your mind. Depression isn't sadness, and it's really no the kind of thing that can be cured by things like nature, rocks, and tea. And perhaps the person best equipped to help myself is me. Like every other illness in the body, mind, or soul, it's very much a case of something out with our control. So to geniuses on the internet, the thing that they know best. I know you're only trying to help, but please, get a rest. I'm sick. I'm sad. My mind is dark. My thoughts are no so nice. But what I need for you is empathy. So please, what the advice? That was really good applause, and I realised I can't clap with this in my hands. <laughs> so I, it was it wasn't meant to look like that. I felt it. Don't As long as long as you know, the applause is focus. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just gonna change pace now. Just mm -hmm. gonna, like, it doesn't even loop in, but so you write predominantly in Scots, yeah. and at the back of the book, because there's an interview with the author at the back of the book. Imagine reading the whole thing and then coming up with those questions, and at the end of the book, there's questions. It was it was a fun experience for me. But anyway, you say that that's because your inner voice and your mother tongue is Scots. So my question then is about the poems that are like 90% Scots, and then there's just like one or two sentences that are pure English, like punctuation. And I'm just wondering, like, is that intentional? Did you, did you mm -hmm. mean to? I will always sacrifice the Scots language to the altar of the rhyme. <laughs> also, it's, 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 it would be inauthentic of me to write an entire book of Scots, because I don't speak Scots all the time. I was raised in a bilingual household. My dad is even Scottish, so really I've got no right being in the States talking about Scots um, in a lot of people's minds. Um, but for me, I just I just wanted someone passed out there with the, the shock <laughs> of your land. It's all right, he's, he's from Bali, you know, he's very much the Scots there, no one. See you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so authentic language for me would be a mixture of Scots and English because that's how I was raised and that's how I do it. But also that's how I make the book accessible to people. Because for a lot of people, they'll hear Scots poetry and think, 
I don't speak Scots, this book isn't for me. But I wanted to write a book that someone could pick up with no prior knowledge of the Scots language, no prior experience with it, and be able to guddle through. And if you understood what that sentence meant, you'll understand the book. Because guddle is a Scots word. So we all got what guddle means, yes? There we go. So for me, I mix Scots and English in order to improve comprehension, improve accessibility, and also to be authentic to myself. Because I do love the Scots language, clearly. I've been doing the Scots one day for about 1,400 days without a break. So there's a bit of a, a passing affinity, shall we say. But, but for me, in order to be authentically myself, I have to juxtapose Scots and English because they're two beautiful languages and they coexist beautifully and they intermingle beautifully and seamlessly. And I couldn't code switch in real life and not code switch in my book. So that's why that and rhyme, like genuinely, if there's a word in English that rhymes, it's going in. <laughs> that's it, it's going in. I love that so much. <laughs> Who cares about Scots? I love rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> 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 Just to clarify, I love Scott. It's <laughs> the best language. <laughs> don't cancel me. <laughs> I love reading it. And what I also really like is that you don't have like a glossary or anything which is amazing and it meant I had to google so much stuff uh, that was perfect so that's yeah. the point yeah my, my point in not putting a glossary is so you google it okay. so you don't pick up the book read the book what words do I need to know okay these are all the Scots words that I need to know close the book put Scots down on the shelf I want you to pick up the book read the book like that's a great word I wonder what that means right I understood what the sentence meant but just that specific word right we're going with DSL Right, we look it up. Oh, I, there's another 16 words. Oh, right, it's been four hours. I've been in DSL, addiction in Scots language. That's me away, learning Scots, having a great time. Because if I put a glossary, it would it, the whole thing would be in the book. I don't, I don't want it to be a passing fancy. I want it to be a lifelong obsession. Because if I have to... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you know it's a lot of it. So, nobody ever picks up a Spanish book and goes, there's no glossary at the back. It's because the book is not the language. The book is an expression of the language and you should look out with the book, out with, great Scott's word, not in a glossary, <laughs> um, out with the book and, and just, just bring Jen. Thanks. You could tell, you could tell I, I snuck that in there a bit more cheeky. Yeah, that's good. I really liked it. I did exactly that. I was like, oh my God, there's like 15 on Scott's word that means something similar and that is fantastic. It's working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was like, oh, I don't have time to simultaneously obsess over sports and come up with questions and prepare for this evening. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue my session after this. Um, I'm gonna give all of you a second to think about a question. If you have a question while I'm asking the next one, so my next question to you is: If there was one poem you would love to be taught in a school. What would it be? And I mean, you can have, it could be different if there's one for a Scottish school and one for for, for the English. <laughs> the English. So what would that, what would that poem be? See, that's the thing, it's such a good question. It's actually a really good question, because ideally I want the whole book in the school. I want the school to buy a book of every time. <laughs> But the work has already been studied in schools, and particularly the poem Civil War. I don't know what it is, but teachers just want that to be studied. I think it's the only one that uses kind of complex metaphor. So they're like, okay, great, stick this in front of higher class. But I actually get to read some of the essays because I'm so nosy. I'm actually so nosy. And I didn't want to write a book because I, I was so afraid of other people interpreting my work without me there to be like, actually, it's about this. You mustn't, you mustn't, you know, deviate from this plan that I have. But when I was reading these essays, first of all, if I'm half as smart and Machiavellian as these Wayne Stank I am, I'm a genius. Because they were like, oh, clearly, clearly on line four, the poet has used this word, but like, it rhymed. That's it, it rhymed. But do you know what? From that point on, I was like, yes, I was no, going to write, correct, 20 marks. Yeah. <laughs> Just at least Andrews University, because no one's going to get it. It's like A, a plus, I think, yeah. Um, 
So for me, reading those essays was incredible because they put so much thought into them, so much thought into my work as well. But also, they got a few things wrong, and here's what they got wrong. <laughs> and and I, went, I well, there's only there's no wrong way to interpret poetry, but there is a wrong way to interpret Scots language. And what they thought was my use, the poet's use of Scots language was aggressive and emulated the voice of an abuser. Now, that piece, Civil War, is from the perspective of the survivor. So they had heard a woman speaking Scots and seen it on the page and interpreted the Scots language by a woman as a masculine, abusive, aggressive force. I didn't say this to the way because I didn't want to be like, you know, you've got this wrong. But it made me think about the perceptions we have about the Scots language because I have been told umpteen times that my use of Scots is masculine, it's aggressive, and it's it's not suitable for certain scenarios. And so what I did was I arranged a class visit and I, I asked the general class what we thought about Scots and those things were coming up as stereotypes, you know, what, what stereotypes do you think about Scots? It's aggressive, it's masculine. And then by the end of the class, I asked them if those uh, preconceived notions had been subverted. And they said they had. So I think that's kind of a testament to using Scots in everyday life, using Scots as women, using Scots as, as such a natural, normal way of speaking and not as something aggressive or, or inherently masculine. Because for me, Scots is a love language. And I don't just mean romantically. Well, exclusively don't mean romantically because my partner doesn't speak Scots. But um, <laughs> he's trying, though. We've got Curry in. So that's <laughs> one, one more thing. Um, but for me, Scots love language because I was mothered in Scots. I was nurtured in Scots. And I was tell off in Scots. So there's that aggression for me sometimes, but there's the love that's at the root of it. It's, it's my mum is a Scots speaker. So every command, every imperative, everything she said to me was in Scots. So for me to hear Scots as masculine and rough and aggressive doesn't it, it's in conflict with my my view that Scots is is the mother tongue for a reason because it survived in homes and mums were the ones using it. And some of the most beautiful words that have survived are the words of the kitchen, the words of the home, the words of cleaning and, and moving around this domestic space with ease and with grace. So for me, Scots is a beautiful gentle nurturing language and I think we should make that the stereotype. Nothing to do with your question. It has absolutely everything to do with my question but it did not work as a as you just like going right into a thought <laughs> which is fine because that was a really really beautiful answer and I'm better for hearing it and I think everyone else is as well. Do, do you have a poem that you would like to read in response to that? Oh, eh, well, I did. I'm not having children. That's the moment. You've one. done it. You've done it. Yeah. I mean, should we, uh, should we, I mean, I can do another one if you want. I've brought a whole book here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think do one. I think do one that you think would maybe benefit so, young people. Since we're talking about Scots, I'm going to do Address the Delete, which is a shameless ripoff of Burns, who wrote Address the Haggis, obviously. But I hate, I hate the fact that Burns is people's first and last experience with Scots. It's, 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 people have actually said to me that they would get beaten for using Scots words and then get Scots words beaten into them to stand up on the 25th of a forum one when it was appropriate and nice and, and okay. So I decided to take a wee um, leaf out of Burnaby's book. And by that, I mean just a whole page, because uh, this is addressed the lead. Per fa your honest sonsy face that hangs his Scots is a disgrace. A lead that's meant for lesser hangs, no there to learn. A lead well kent by money folk, just nae hear him. A hint keyboards, a wee troll hides, a boon your soul that hatred bides your words. A knock that traps a rain again my heat. Tax mere than dubs off filled with pish to drown me deed. We can the rock your soul contains. One single lead a hint your brain, I look upon you filled with shame, but then you fast. The Scots leave moans drive on in spite of all your snatch. Then, word for word, Scots will only be my time and tongue, though I can give, give it all I will until my final breath. Our poems will be said, they bear his lang past my death. 
Is there that troll that snares and shame or cries me money I hate for name or seeks to cause me muckle pain for what I do? Looks doing with sneer and scorn for view on what I say. Poor dear. See him out his screen, his grammar neat, his English clean, he fecks for country and for queen, but does he see? If that is going to look his way, that is me. But mark the chills that speak the lead to a ken, it's living never did and ken, it's fit for all the time, no special days. And sees the poor wee hypocrites on twenty fifths and hogmanes. He powers, for we may every hour give me smed and you can't smooth on Scotland once they ling with lobes with a hate for heat. But can you wish a great prayer? Holy man. So much. I would love to bring that in, into uh, into the school that I work at. At least do if, every time we do. It's like this is really, really old Scots, <laughs> yeah. and I'm just like, can you do something a little bit fresher? So I'm it bringing makes, it into the it makes what life. speakers feel like they're Scots is authentic because mm -hmm. it doesn't reflect the only literary Scots that we teach in the school. So Scots speakers constantly think that their Scots is the real Scots. And for that reason, I don't like all my games. <laughs> uh, with that, I think we've got time for one or two questions. Um, and I'm just going to take a second to say, despite what I have maybe led you to believe, a question is actually quite a short sentence for the question mark <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so, keeping that in mind, do we have any questions? There's one from online. Oh. So I could do that one. People watching online. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, this one's from Pat. Uh, was there a poem you always knew would have to be in the book when you decided to write a book? And were there any that you worried about including? I worry about everything. <laughs> so. Yes, all of them I wanted to include. But there were poems that I said the same thing in Scots and English, and I knew I had to include the Scots version because for me, talking about mental illness in Scots is important because I talked to my therapist in Scotland. And they actually did a, a, a new tiny study of, of children in therapy who were Scots speakers. They code switched into English to talk about their mental illness because they didn't feel that therapy was the right place to talk in Scots. And for me, that breaks my heart because imagine switching out of your mother tongue so you don't offend the sensibilities of a therapist. For me that's that that kind of is the opposite of what therapy is about. It's supposed to be authenticity, genuine feeling. So uh, uh the year I shouldn't have had I talked about mental illness, I talked about suicidal ideation, but I wanted to include the year I shouldn't have had because it's in Scots and I'm mentally ill in Scots too. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, hello. Um, obviously, out with is the the best word if you want to give anybody one Scots word. Um, but besides that, are there any other words that you would give to just people to go, hey, if you want to inject a little bit in your life, this is a really good one that you will use on a frequent basis. That's such a good question. People usually watch me about Scots word, but that's such a nice way of phrasing it because. I'd say I go with a verb because everybody loves verbs. I love verbs. Um, I go for scliff. Scliff, right? So you got an apple, and you're you're thinly slicing it. You're taking a scliff. So a scliff, the wee bit you've cut off, the wee thin slice, but you're also scliffing the apple. So you got a bonus noun as well. I like nouns as well. <laughs> and and the reason the reason I like scliff so much because it's it's a fairly you know it's a boring word. It's not an interesting word, but for me because Scots in memory is so tightly and inextricably linked. That's that's just me sitting on my papa's knee while he scliffs me an apple. You know, that's that's it. I'm right back there every time I hear it. And and for me, that is such, that's a verb that's just so tied with every every scliff you take is just every scliff you take. <laughs> every scliff you take is a it's a memory, it's hair, it's attention, it's love. Because I could have eaten the apple. Do you know what I mean? I could have just got over myself. I didn't like the feel. I didn't like the feel. So my papa just slipped the apple, peeling this apple. And and for me, that's just, that's love. Love is in the slip. 
Um, <laughs> there you go, there's two songs you can just to remember, so slow. Thank you so much for your question. I think we can take at least one more. Do we have another one? We've got one down. Just that right. Thanks. Uh, first, uh, on behalf of many new Scots, we are so grateful to you uh, to helping us overcome the uh, immigrant imposter syndrome. Uh, really, honestly, there are days when it helps a lot. Uh, my question, as a faithful chronicler of Moira and her hate, will she come back or have to retire to her? <laughs> I was unaware of just why this is so hilarious. But in my example sentence, do you know how Duolingo has like this cast of characters? Well, I've got Moira, right? Big Moira and her by the end. So Moira's done everything. Every every time I need to describe a person, Moira's there. Every time I need to describe a salacious act, she's there too. She's she's my favourite person. She will be back. She will return. <laughs> Moira season two. <laughs> That was so good. You should go and do this stuff. <laughs> um, possibly one more. Do we have another one? No? Oh, love a tentative question. Let's go. As also not a Scott that you may be able to tell, um, do you have any advice for those of us who are new to the country? in uh, kind of accommodating our Scots friends and being, I guess, kind to your history and your past uh, and welcoming and not anything that could be offensive or things we should know about the Scottish history, if that makes any sense. Be curious. When someone uses a word you don't understand, approach it with curiosity. I think you should do it with all languages, really. If someone uses a word you don't understand, oh, what was that word? What does that word mean? And then start using it. Because I think a lot of people who come to Scotland, or even people within Scotland who don't grow up in the Scots language, feel like it's not for them. And this cultural perception of Scots had to be learned in your nanny's knee. Specifically the dialect you learned in your nanny's knee, because you couldn't go around making words for everywhere. But I take a pan dialect approach to my poetry and my language and my use of Scots, because I like all these words. And nobody's ever told me I can't use English words that are not from my neck of the woods. So what I would say is, if you if you want to learn to speak Scots, you want to use Scots, and like let the language meet you where you are. You don't have to put on a Scottish accent. Accent and pronunciation are the same. When I speak Spanish, it's more Airdrie than it is Madrid. <laughs> it's there's a there's a definite you know there's a lot of iron and out that needs to be done, but there's an iron and out that doesn't need to be done because when I speak to a Spanish person, they're just so excited. I'm using the language. And I hope that's what you encounter if you use Scots, but it, to, to, to support your friends, don't laugh at them. Don't laugh at them unless they're telling a joke. Because Scots, is they funny? And don't laugh at them if the joke's crap, because you don't want to encourage bad behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was a funny joke. <laughs> but don't laugh unless they're telling jokes. Scots gets pigeonholed into comedy. It's it's a lot of people will think, okay, it's okay for still games. It's okay for me to talk to my doctors like that. So if someone's if someone's talking to you in Scots, don't laugh unless they're telling a Scots joke. Just approach it with a serious, serious tone and a and a and a, a real kind of curiosity and a niceness. Because for a lot of Scots speakers, they probably won't speak Scots to you. And that's sad. Because they'll code switch into English the minute they think that they're not in a safe space, they won't they won't use Scots. So if you preemptively start using Scots, I'd be more likely to use Scots with you. So yeah, that's how you can support people. Thank you. You have such good answers. I really <laughs> enjoyed this. I, I hope you all have to. I hope you have also. Mostly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can go and buy Len's book and you can buy the books of some of our other performers tonight. And you can also get your books signed. So, yeah. Please give it up for Len and our other performers one more time and then buy the books. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing so wonderful.